shall we start? All right, welcome. I'm Shirley Fenton, the Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. And thank you coming, for coming today for our Institute Research Seminar. We are very delighted to have Dr. David Diltz here to speak to us today. Uh, I'm not going to do the formal introduction. I'll leave that to my colleague over here. Before we start, I'd like to have uh, a bit of time just to give a couple of announcements. On Wednesday, January the 28th, two days from now, we will hold our Smarter Health Seminar. This seminar will be given by Dr. Pardon me, Mr. Wayne Goodbranson. Wayne will be talking on informatics and the continuum of care, the changing landscape. Wayne is the president and CEO of the Brandon Group. He, uh, his company is an industry analyst and looks at over 450 e-health uh, companies in Canada. So if you're interested in knowing about the landscape of e-health in, in Canada, I invite you to come and hear his talk. In addition, uh, in February, our next institute research seminar will be on Wednesday, February the 11th. Professor Dominic Covey will be giving a talk on the state of e-health readiness in Ontario. That seminar will be in the adjoining room uh, to this lecture hall in Davis Centre 1304 at 12 p.m. So I invite you to come to that presentation as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to, invite, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Andrew uh, Diltz. And you may think that there's some relationship between uh, Andrew and the speaker. I'll leave that to Andrew to explain. Andrew it, has just uh, received his master's in management sciences. So con congratulations, a a Andrew. So Andrew, will you introduce our speaker? Excellent. Thank you, Shirley. Um, yes, as introduced, my name is Andrew Diltz. I was told just before the talk that I probably don't want to identify that this is actually my father standing over on my right, uh, simply because then I'll have to live under his reputation. He was actually a professor in management sciences here at the University of Waterloo for 13 years in the late 80s and through the 90s. And uh, there was an interesting story that both my brother and I started university here just at the, at the turn of the millennium. And we both started the University of Waterloo, but that's the same year that my father went down to Vanderbilt University. So it was interesting having a reverse situation where we're standing in the driveway about to go to college and waving goodbye as our parents pack up the car and leave, as opposed to the way that it usually is the other way around. Um, he was headed off to Vanderbilt University to have a very unique situation where he's now, he became cross-appointed. So he's both with the Owen Graduate School of Management. He sees the business side of things, but he's also over in the School of Engineering. So he sees a lot of the technical specifics. And uh, since then, he's recently become a co-director for the Center for Management Research and Healthcare there at Vanderbilt University. And I always find that it's best uh, when I'm introducing people to take myself out of the shadow because I've heard this talk a few times and I know that he'll explain a lot better than I do what the purpose of the Center for Management Research and Healthcare is and why it's doing so many great things. So without further ado, and I can't call him dad. I was told introducing to people is not dad, it's Dr. Dill. So, Dr. Dill. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take that one away. Thank you. <laughs> oh, what do you say? Gosh. Thank you, son. Um, the title of my talk is Are Clinical Trials Going the Way of Olsenville? And uh, if any of you have been following what's been happening in the stock market, uh, I, I decided to update it. It's not working. This one, right? Yeah? Oh, I love going to computer campuses. All right. Um, oh, that didn't work either. I'm going to just talk off the cuff. <laughs> it's dead. No, it's nothing works. It's, it's, no, it's sending escape now, yes. You know, it doesn't like people from the States. Uh, <laughs> nothing. Have you ever seen somebody give a 15-minute talk with one slide? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to watch that. We're about to. We're about to. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the people do this. Okay. Um, you go ahead. I'll go ahead. Let me talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, what happens is, when I was here at Waterloo, I used to study the automotive industry. And, and I um, basically looked at things called computer integrated manufacturing and how, to, how things like the U.S. automotive industry tried to automate and work their way out of problems. 
And since then, uh, since I've been to Vanderbilt, I've started studying oncology or cancer clinical trials research. And there's an amazing amount of similarities into what cancer clinical trials informatics look like today and what the automotive industry looked like in the early 80s. And so I'm going to talk to you about a lot of those analogies um, soon. Uh, <laughs> Before I do that, let me kind of give you a background. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to song and dance while they work on the technology. Um, let me explain how oncology clinical trials work in America. Uh, number one is there's a thing called the National Cancer Institute, um, which basically is the major funding source. And they fund two different major areas who do research, one of which are called cooperative groups. And cooperative groups are a set of academic medical centers to say, we all want to research together researching on cancer. Okay. Then, so cooperative groups are a joint of them. Then what happens is you have academic medical centers who have what are called comprehensive cancer centers or cancer centers, and they do specific oncology and cancer research. Then you've got community practices, and community providers basically say, I'm a local physician and I want to do oncology research. Right? So you can do oncology research, any of these set of streams, but primarily it's funded by the National Cancer Institute. And as somebody who used to teach management sciences and who also teaches in business, that's the second slide. Keep clicking it. One more. Okay. Okay. You can say GM. Hmm? No, well, you're a third right. What else is it going to say? There you go. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say Nortel, but it was advised not to. So. <laughs> So basically, um, what happens is Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile was the first automotive, first gas-powered automotive car in America. It was the first car in America to have an automatic transmission. It was the first car to have a GPS system in it. Okay? It was the first mass-produced car. It was before Henry Ford started mass-producing cars. Okay? And it was the best-selling car in North America in 1976. It went completely broke in 2004. They shut it down, okay? Because it couldn't sustain its, the challenges and the changes, okay? So when you look at oncology and you look at cancer clinical trials, you say there's tons and tons and tons of money being poured into this stuff. It's got to be successful. Well, the answer is it's not because you're pouring money into stuff that's really basically not going to work. Um, so what happened is I started this project by talking and actually investigating Vanderbilt University, and I said, how do you open a cancer clinical trial? Tell me what it's like to do a cancer clinical trial. And first they looked at me like, well, no one's ever asked us that question before. And I said, well, okay, let's see how long it takes. Let's see what it takes to open a cancer clinical trial. And we did, and when we did that, the first response was, oh my gosh, it can't be that bad. So I said, well, yeah, it really is that bad. So the, the US federal government said, well, we're going to fund you to find out if Vanderbilt is uniquely terrible. So I went out and I studied a cooperative group, basically one of these amalgamations. I said, you know what? The cooperative groups are even worse. And they went, oh my gosh, this is really bad. So I tell you what we want you to do. We want you to study another cooperative group. We want you to study three more comp comprehensive cancer centers. And we're the first independent group that's ever been studied how the government itself approves clinical trials. And we put them all together. We went, oh my goodness, it is really bad. Uh, and so everybody's kind of shocked at how totally abysmal it is about how long it takes to get stuff started. And when we talk about taking stuff started, I, I, I can wander. You ready for the blue screen? I can go by the blue screen. You can put whatever you want behind it. Okay. You have this really, really, really neat idea for a cancer clinical trial. Basically, it says, I've got this wonderful drug that may, in fact, cure cancer. From the time he says, I've got this neat, wonderful study, and I'm going to take this study, and I'm going to hand it to you, in my university to open this study, how many days do you think it takes for him to wander through the entire system before you can actually put the first patient on study? How long do you think? Huh? Two years. You're a little short. You're a little long. Cut it in half and you got it. <laughs> Two and a half years. If you have the cure for cancer in your hand today, before you can get started getting the first patient takes you two and a half years. By the way, you have to do this three times because there's three phases of study. Phase one basically says, I don't know if it kills anybody, so I've got to try it. The second phase of study says, let me try to figure out kind of roughly what the diagnosis or the uh, dosage should be. And phase three says, okay, let's try that dosage in a whole bunch of people. Okay? 
every phase takes about two years to open. Now, there's two major problems with that. Number one is, if you're a company, or you're a, you're a brilliant young investigator, and you have this really neat molecule, and you go out and you patent this molecule, you only have that patent allowed for how many years? Hmm? How many years do you have a patent for? 20 at most. Depends, really depends. But let's say 20 for right now. Okay? If you have the patent for 20 years, it takes you two and a half years per phase before you can do it, plus it takes another year to put patients on the study. So you've got three and a half years per phase, so you're in 10 plus years before you can even think about getting into the marketplace. There's two problems with that. Number one is that 20 years is fixed by government law, which means it's going to run out of patent, you're going to lose all your money, which is why cancer pharmaceuticals are exorbitantly expensive. If you came down with cancer in America today, they would give you one drug that's $50,000 a regime. That means to go through this, $50,000. The shots, just the supplementary shots alone are $3,000 a shot, and you need one per cycle. Why are they so expensive? Because you had to wait 10 years before you could get into the marketplace. So one problem is the money. The second problem is you had 10 years worth of patients, or 10 years worth of cancer, um, people with cancer who ran into difficulty and issues. Okay? Imagine if we could cut that two and a half years in half. Okay? We can take it from two and a half years down to, say, a year and a half. Is it working? Oh, we're restarting the computer. Oh, we're being recorded, so I'm not going to say anything about Windows. <laughs> so, um, so number one is imagine how many people are harmed by that, and then imagine what would happen if we could actually do this faster. Now, there's a really interesting thing about clinical trials. Is number one is when you do a clinical trial, you also want to have a fast failure. In other words, if I put this into somebody, I want this to be, if it's not going to work, I want to know right now, because I don't want to keep going. I don't want to have a study that drags on and on and on and on and on and on. Well, that part of the problem is called accruals, and accruals talks about who actually shows up to do a cancer clinical trial. What we've also to study in some of our other research is basically how long it takes to get patients on study. And when I said it takes about a year, that's really optimistic. If you're doing a phase three clinical trial, which is the last phase, usually it's multiple years. Which means the more years it takes, the less time you have for your patent, and the more impact or the more harm you might have with, people, with patients. Okay? Um, this is actually harder to do than you think. Uh, let me talk about the methodology, what you do with the methodology. What we did is we went into uh, an organization, and there's three steps in the methodology. We come up and said, hi, we're from Vanderbilt University. How you doing? And the first thing they said is, you're with the medical school. And we say, no, we're not. And they go, what? I'm from the Owen Graduate School of Management which teaches MBAs, and I'm also from the School of Engineering. And they go, what? Right? You mentioned about Bill Hirsch. You know, I'm going to go see Bill. Yeah, Bill's over there. You know, it's like, I'm not from that part of campus kind of a thing. They go, oh, OK, fine. And we say, OK, we're going to do three things. What I want you to do is I'm going to sit down with everybody who's in the process of opening a clinical trial, and I'm going to ask you, tell me what you do. And you'd sit there and say, well, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And it's like, oh, that's really interesting. Then we go out and we get the policies and procedures manual. And there it looks like, that looks like a policies and procedures manual if I've ever seen one. Look at this policy and procedures manual. Look at the size of this sucker. This, this, this is a policy. Look at this thing. I'm going to steal this sucker. This is, this is what you get as policy and procedures manual. Okay. My God, here's what you should be doing. Right? Here's the listing of exactly what you should be doing. This is a policy and procedures manual. Then what happens is we do a really sinister thing. You're going to hate me, but I don't care. Uh, this is a policies and procedures manual, and we go through this, and we go, oh, you know what? She never mentioned this part. Oh, okay. And then we do the absolute most sinister thing. We would go down, and we would actually go through all the paperwork it took to open a clinical trial. Okay? And we have done this dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And every time we've done it, we say, please give us a typical clinical trial. And they say, oh, that would be this. And they say, here. And we go, oh, okay. Well, yeah, this is, this is pretty typical. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, this is pretty, yeah, you said this, and you turn the page and go, oh, but, but you never said this. And you know what they would say universally? Oh, that one's different. We have never been to a place that they didn't give us the typical clinical trial that wasn't different, that wasn't special. It's like, okay. Now, as people are interested in informatics, you want to know the real terror? There is about 50% overlap between what you say you do 
what the policies and procedures manual say you should do and what you actually do. Half the stuff doesn't fit. Okay? When you actually put it together, it doesn't fit. Our most dis the disturbing time when we did this is we went through one of these things and we had interviewed everyone in the organization. We'd gone through all the policy procedures, procedures manuals. And we went through one clinical trial and we found a thing called a pharmacy manual. And we had no idea what a pharmacy manual was. And we went to the head of this organization and we said, we've gone through all your records and we found this thing called a pharmacy manual. And he said, and I quote, damn, we could have used that. <laughs> and it was like, okay, you need a bunch of people from the business school and from engineering to go, hi, we know what your system is. Like, oh my God. Okay, so that was really scary. Now, another reason we do this, we go through this. I will give this back. I tend to walk off with people's phones. That's why I give this stuff back, okay? <laughs> now, let me give you an example of why we do this. We actually want to study why people think they do what they do because you run into some really, really interesting things. There's a story that in 1939, England did not want to be invaded by Germany. So they sent every piece of artillery they had and they shipped it all over to the coast. And they had the procedures manual. And so everybody was following the procedures manual to make sure they knew how to fire this piece of artillery correctly. So they went through as a five person crew and people went up and they loaded the cannon and they did all this kind of stuff. And at one point in time, two of the soldiers went over to the side and stood just like this. And they'd fire the artillery piece off and then go do their things. It was okay, that's cool. So, they decided they'd be really smart just to make sure they knew what they were doing. They went and got an old World War I veteran. They said, hey, come on down. Come on, come on down. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> and he's still alive. <laughs> come on down. He said, what? Let's, let's make sure we're doing this right. So the, the soldiers go over here and they do all this kind of stuff, they do all this kind of stuff. And they come over here and they stand at attention, they do this kind of thing. Boom, the can artillery piece goes off. So they go over to the guy and they said, hey, are we doing it right? He's going, yeah, yeah, looks about right. I said, okay. What are they doing? Oh, they're holding the horses. Because <laughs> in the World War I, the way you moved artillery pieces was by horses. And when you fired off the cannon, horses would shy. And so two people had to stand there to hold the horses. And they were very faithfully going through the process of holding the horses, just in case, right? Well, in all of our time doing this stuff, we would talk to people and they would say, why are you doing this? And they'd say, because the FDA requires it. And we would call the FDA and we'd say, do you require this? And they'd say, no. And we'd say, why are they sending this stuff into you? And they'd say, we have no idea. I said, what do you do with it? Well, we file it. Because in the US, the law is, if you send something to the FDA and they don't respond within 30 days, it's okay. So you know what they kept? They kept pouring stuff in the FDA and the FDA kept going, we don't know, put it away. And we talked to people like, oh my God, how much? Oh, this takes a month to put together. Okay, cool. Did anybody read it? Oh yeah, the FDA. FDA? No, we don't care. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, after doing this, we created what are called process maps. And process maps basically say you lay out every single step in the process. Who's involved and what do they look like and what do they do? Now, we build big process maps. The smallest process map we built is 30 feet by five feet and eight point font, okay? That's one step in the process, one phase, okay? I love process maps because I was sitting in front of the, the, um, the director of the National Cancer Institute presenting some of our data. And the director of the National Cancer, John Nieder, was a very smart and very busy individual, okay? And I'm sure, particularly the faculty have sat in meetings where you're giving a meeting, you're giving a presentation, everybody's doing this. You know, nobody pays any attention like you were doing, you know. Where you, were, you were day trading, I know, before this, but okay, yeah. <laughs> Right? And so everybody sit there and do this. And John was sitting there, and I've ne never met the man before, and I'm making the presentation, and he's just not paying a damn bit of attention, which is just scary. So we start unrolling the process map. Now this process map is 50 feet long by five feet, okay? So we start unrolling it, and we're unrolling it behind him. And so, by the way, just to let you know, that's probably from there to the end of that second panel. That's how big these things are, five feet, okay? So about yay high. So he's doing this, he's going, And he paid attention. It's like, okay, I don't care what this process map cost, he paid attention, right? So you're talking about information technology, this is he paid attention, we put it together. So we said, okay, how long does it take to actually do this stuff? And what we discovered is the time it takes to do through a cooperative group program is 800 days. 
Then it takes another 120 days to open it at an individual institution. There's a thing called the National Cancer Institute of Canada that before a place like McMaster can open a cancer clinical trial has to go through there, okay? Which means it's 800 days there plus another 120 days, that's 920 days to get your first patient on study, okay? It's crazy, all right? And we have these really neat process maps that show loops. Nope, guess not. Okay, one of the big things whenever you do one of these kind of processes is this. There's a problem. You're sitting down talking to respected investigators like you. <laughs> Respect. No, you're, you're my young, you always got to go with the kids. My young investigator right here. This is my incredibly important investigator. You know when I go to the investigator and I said, who's the problem? His response is, it's a cooperative groups. And I go to the cooperative groups and I say, who's the problem? And they say, it's the government. And I go to the government and the government says, it's uh, cooperative groups. And if it's not them, it's him. Right? And it's a classic case of, they did it, them, okay? Well, when you actually find the timing and you actually run through all the timing, the answer is yes, it's them. It's all of them. Because what happens is the investigator's thinking of the first part of the trial when everything is really important. And the middle part of the trial, they don't care about. The cooperative group's worried about the middle part of the trial because that's when they're developing it. The government is just kind of worried about different parts. So when everybody says, I'm not the problem, they're the problem, it all depends upon where in the process they're talking about. So I went to one of the heads of the cooperative groups, really interesting, really, really great guy by the name of Rich Shilsky, and he said, listen, if they just gave me more money, we could open a lot more studies. So I said, Rich, cool, let's find out. So we took the process and we simulated if we doubled his budget. Now I want you to remember, it's 800 days. If we doubled Rich's budget, how much time do you think we'd save? 800 days? Nope. Nothing. Damn close. But that's not quite right. We actually saved time. How much time? <laughs> no. <laughs> we saved 15 days. Out of 800 days, we saved 15 days. Okay? Now, I've made this presentation. I've given this talk a couple years. And every time Rich is in the audience, he kind of grumbles back to me. And he had a great line last time. He raised his hand and he said, I tell you what, let's do an experiment. Give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Was it an academic? Yeah, I can buy that part, okay? The reason for that is if I'm gonna give you the money, you can't do it alone. You've gotta go through the cooperative group. Cooperative group, you can't do it alone. You've gotta go through the cancer therapy and evaluation program. And you can't do it alone either. You've all gotta work together. Have you ever tried to get multiple institutions working together simultaneously get anything done? I know some people have, right? You think it's bad inside the same institution? Imagine it's across states. And they all have to agree together to all work together and make it work. Okay? It's really, 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 really hard to do. Okay? It's very, very, very difficult to do. Did I kill your computer? Do I have to buy you a computer now? <laughs> <laughs> when I was at Waterloo, we had computers that worked fast. <laughs> um, so I went up to people and I said, this system is totally screwed up. And I said, aha, you are a management scientist. Tell us how to fix it, oh guru. And I went, oh, okay. First thing to do is stop accepting everything. Now what happened is there's my brilliant young investigator. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Going to win a Nobel Prize in about 90 years. <laughs> you got to still be alive for it. But, gonna be nice. but what you're going to put in a study. But you're a brilliant investigator too, right? So you're going to do what? You're going to put in a study and you're a brilliant investigator and you're going to do what? Put in a study. You're kind of an average investigator. What are you going to do? Put a study. Why? Because all the brilliant people are going to do it. Right? So I'm going to put a study. What happened is the cooperative groups would accept all kinds of studies. And I listened to them do this thing. In one of the cooperative groups, unknown, I was sitting in one of their meetings. And they're sitting there saying, okay, we have this study. What's, no, I picked on you. No. What's your name? Chantel? Chantel. Chantel's got this study. She's been working on it. It's a great study. Then one of them says, now, if we open the study of your institution, how many patients will you accrue? Say five to ten. There you go. How many patients will you accrue? Say five to ten. Good. How many patients will you accrue? Now, you're smart. <laughs> he goes, you know what? Chantel? Chantel? Chantel's study is really good, but you know, there's another study that they've already accrued a thousand patients on. And they're doing the data analysis now, and they're about to publish in the next year. The leader of the group said this, and I quote, that's all well and good, but Chantel spent a lot of time in this. How many patients will you accrue? 
in Israel, five to ten. Okay? They just triggered 800 days of work because you spent a lot of time. And we don't want to hurt your feelings because that would be bad. Even though by the time you get it open, it's, who cares? Okay? Who cares about it because it's already done? Right? So what transpires a lot, it's oncologists are too nice to each other. You know, my first incredibly sophisticated operations research solution, just say no. We don't have enough resource to open every study, so don't do it. There's not enough patients who will go on clinical trials. Don't do it. Just say no. And as students, you'll appreciate this. Watching faculty, write it down. Just say no. And it's like, OK, you know, just, just stop it. Stop doing it. When I was here in Canada, no, actually, yeah, it was, it was another cooperative group. I have this tendency as a business professor to go through and look at data. And I said, OK, how many clinical trials do you open per year? Well, we open about 18 to 20. That's cool. OK. How many clinical trials protocols do you have in process today right now? Oh, well, we've got about, oh, 75 or 80. I said, OK, you've got 75 or 80 in process right now. You open about 15 to 20 per year. Now, there's a management science major in this room who can work this out. How long will it take to clear the queue? It's you. <laughs> yeah, to clear the queue. No, just if they open, they open 15 to 20 per year, they have 80 to 100 in the queue. Yep. <laughs> He's got a master's degree. A long time, yeah. Oh, that's it. That's it. Stop. Back here. Back here. Okay. Okay, now we go back up. Okay. Now. As a way of instant repeat, for those of you who have missed the latest edition of Lost, let me bring you up to speed. <laughs> um, by the way, nobody ever does this alone. You always do it with a team. There's a team of a bunch of people that work for us, from MBA students to master's students to uh, PhD students um, and postdoc students. Okay? So what do you think when I say I read it in the journal? Okay? When I do this in medical audience, guess what? They read it in the New England Journal. What do I read it in? The Wall Street Journal. All right? So right off the bat, we're not talking the same language. You're talking about informatics. Informatics is hard because we don't talk the same words. We don't mean the same thing when we say the journal. By the way, you want to know the weirdest thing about medicine? I still don't understand this. Do you know the second most prestigious place to be on the article? If you're going to publish an article, there's you and 15 authors. The last author. It's bizarre. I've had people fight to be the last author. It's like, you know, we kind of put the janitor and everybody's the last author. Oh, no, I'm going to be the last author. Okay, right, you know. It's kind of like the first one is the person who wrote it, the last one who funded it, and the other people get divided by whatever the number of people are. Okay. So, by the way, you read, you read an economics journal, you have more than two authors, it's like, it's fluff. <laughs> it's okay. Right? Now, how would a biologist fix a customer's radio? Okay. If you're a research scientist, you're going to fix a customer's broken radio. What are you going to do? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get a grant. Because you need to buy a lot of identically functioning radios. Because what you're going to do is, after three rounds, after long delays, three rounds, grant reviews, you're going to get the radios, you're going to build a lab, hire a tag, you know, you're going to have all this really great stuff, and you're going to hire these really inexpensive students, and you're going to have them break the radios, right? You actually have the hit techs hit the radios with a hammer until they hit the radios, not the techs, stop working. Then you'll get the pieces, ah, when did it stop working? You're going to publish many, many learned papers on how many hits it takes to stop working, how many pieces of shrapnel, it's really good, and what do you do when you're all done? You get more money because you ran out of radios. <laughs> I have a question. What does the customer think? Uh-oh. You know what? We've broken a hell of a lot of radios. We're going to go back to the government and say, hey, give me more money. And the government's going to go, eh. We were discussing earlier about outcomes. Yeah, we spent a lot of money. We had no outcomes. You've broken a whole bunch of radios. Okay? Breaking a whole bunch of radios doesn't help anybody. Fixing a radio does. So I'm going to talk to you about how broken the radio is and how to fix it. Okay? By the way, biomarkers, if any of you pick up a newspaper, it's like biomarkers. I know you guys are in nanotechnologies and cloud computing. If you were in medical school, everything is on biomarkers because that's the latest, hot, great, wonderful whiz-bang toys. Okay? The number of biomarkers that are actually approved, they do one every other year. How many papers are written in biomarkers? This was today. 25,000 papers are written in biomarkers. It's a great way to get tenure. Doesn't make a damn difference to anybody, but it's a great way to get tenure. Right? Why are we doing all this busy work if it really doesn't help? 
Okay, well, I go back once again. I look at the automotive industry. The automotive industry in North America is a really, really, really busy industry. It really doesn't help. Okay? So I've looked at lots and lots of different places, from roses to rockets, from cars to cancer. That's a friend of mine, Alan Sandler, puts it. And I look basically at how to put everything together. When I was here, I was trying to how to integrate all these manufacturing processes together. I was working with a distinguished faculty member in the low vision systems of how to put low vision systems together. And I also looked at basically, can you learn something from one side to bring it to the other? And I'm going to talk to you about lessons I've learned from the automotive industry that I'm trying to bring into the healthcare industry and explain that don't fall into the same traps, because people are falling into the same traps. Okay? So <laughs> I love this. This was 2008. You build it, they will come. Hi, right, we got cars. Right? Yeah. Well, guess what? People are really skeptical. Right? Well, if you go back to the 1970s, I don't want you to stop now. I want you to go back before half the audience was born. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Remember this. Remember we could buy an Oldsmobile for $5,000? Okay? Now, I want to show you this because this is still a cool car to have. Right? You make the Corvette Stingray, 1970 Corvette Stingray. Would anybody who, buy, who builds one of these things, the Toyota Carina, ever be comp competition? No, because you know what? They can't even figure out where to put the rearview mirrors. <laughs> these are not comp competition, okay? Don't worry about it, right? Well, what's happened since? Well, this is the old one I gave you, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, come on. Oh, I broke it again. Ah, yeah, okay. All right. What happens in 2006? By the way, this is before any of the financial meltdown. 2006, oh my God, we're losing market share. What do you do? Because I went to business school. If I'm losing market share, what do I do is I give rebates. Give money back. If you lose money and you give money away so people take your car away, what do you think happens to your profits? You go to hell. <laughs> Look at this. And by the way, I love them going to Washington in December saying, it was a financial meltdown that did us in. Folks, I sorry, it, no, all right, it ain't gonna happen, all right. Well, then I love this. Those of you that are students, I want you to think about if you went to your teacher and said, "Oh, you know, I really need twelve billion dollars," and then you come back three weeks later and said, "I was wrong, I need 18. It was a round-off error. <laughs> no. Why do these people keep doing what they're doing? It's because that's how they built the system. That's how oncology clinical trials are done, is because they were built in the 1950s, and that's how they work. And I'm trying to persuade them that this is not how they should be done. We should break the mold and change it completely. By the way, good news, ladies. Our fruitcake sales have exceeded the entire net profits of GM, Ford, and Chrysler. For years! <laughs> right? It's amazing. So, what was good yesterday might not be good today, and what was bad yesterday is even worse today. And that's what we're going to talk about, is what's worse today. So, what would you think of? I want you to remember these when I go through my talk. And I'm going to go quickly, okay? A journal that accepts 70% of all papers that are submitted. What would you think of a builder who always quoted 60 days to remodel a kitchen, regardless of the novelty or complexity of the remodel, or how long similar jobs have taken in the past? Some of you have actually done construction work or watched somebody do construction work on your kitchen? It's always 60 days. 800 days later, it might almost be done, right? <laughs> A coffee franchise that even after building thousands of coffee shops had no way of knowing of building a new one would take a year or seven years. Just never new. They just take as long as they take. An airplane company that never flies 30% of the aircraft they design. And a sports team that never finishes 64% of the games they start. They didn't win, they didn't lose, they just quit. They walked off at the end of the periods. What do they do in hockey? Periods? Three periods. Three. Second period. They walk out in the second period. Go, oh, that was fun. Let's go do something else. Why? Okay. Remember this because we're going to come back. Now, you want to know the most disturbing thing? None of them knew about it and none of them ever asked why. It took somebody from outside to go, excuse me? This is really not very good. Okay. So remember these numbers. We're going to come back to them in my talk. Okay. So we talked a little bit about it. Discover Sorry, I don't care. All right. This is like, wow, I got this really neat molecule. This is really, really, really cool stuff. I'm going to put it in laboratory. I'm going to torture Graham Strong's jacket. I'm going to put it in rats and mice and all kinds of stuff, make sure they don't die. If they don't die, I'm going to put it in humans, and hopefully they won't die either. If they don't die, this is good. Now I'm going to try to figure out what kind of exact kind of dosage I should have. Once I figure out the dosage, now I go to the big, long, lots of people studies. 
Then I go to the FDA, and then I go to any kind of post-marketing. If any of you ever read the Wall Street Journal, this, the Wall Street Journal hates the FDA, and they bash this like crazy. They ignore all that part. So the part I'm looking at is that part. I'm looking at the phases of clinical trials. Because the minute you start putting in a human being until you send it to the FDA to get it approved, that's what I'm researching, particularly in oncology. Okay? Now, promise, the premise, the time to go from what's called bench to bedside, from the time you discover to a patient, cannot be reduced if you're doing what are called non-value-added activities. And I'll talk about that, what those things are in just a second. Okay. I mentioned this. This is who they are. They've got the NCI, the cooperative groups, the designated cancer centers, and computing oncologists. So there's different networks. And I thank all the study sites because it's really embarrassing. I come up with really, really embarrassing data, and they all go, thank you. Right? So, I mean, I come up with stuff that's not, not well, could be looked at negatively. It's a proper way to phrase it. Okay. So I talked to you about process maps. We talked about what you say you do, what you should do, what you do. Then I talked to you, oh, by the way, this is the very, very, very first one we did. And way over here, way over here, is when you have the brilliant idea to do the study, and way over here is when you actually close down the study. And we said, where do you open the study so a first patient kid involved is right there. All this work, this is the trial step. This is when you have patients involved. This is how much time it takes to get set up. Students, once in your life, will you find some place that no one's ever, ever, ever researched? This was that time. There are dozens of papers on here about how to increase accruals, how do you speed up the process, all this stuff once the study's open, and nobody studied how long it took to set up. Because that's just how long it took. That's exactly the same philosophy that Oldsmobile had. How long did it take to set up to make the car? Well, as long as it took. Toyota said, no, we're not going to play that way. We're going to change this very dramatically. We're going to focus in on setups. So I'm taking a lot of stuff that Toyota already knows how to do and apply it into the medical realm and look specifically at setups. And I mentioned what you find out in setups. Oh, by the way, is setups a big deal? This is what this 56% of the time of a total time of a study is running the study. 44% is actually setting up the study. This is phase two. This is phase three. 55% is getting ready to work, and 46% is actually doing the work. It's a hell of a lot of time to do the work or get set up to do the work. Nobody looked at it. Okay? And it's over all phases of studies. Okay, now, can you tell me the punchline? The horse? Right, holding the horses? Okay. My question here is how many horses are you holding? How many things are you doing because you do them? Because that's how it's done? When I was in industry, um, I, we used to have a thing called a page 13. A page 13 was a bunch of statistics that my company built. We were a wholly owned subsidiary of a really, really big company. And my accountant spent like two weeks gathering all this junk that we never used. And so one time I said, okay, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to create it, and I want you to put it in your door, and I don't want you to send it to anybody. And she's going, oh, my God, I'm going to get fired. And I said, no, 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 I'll take the heat. I'll take, just put it in your door, don't do anything with it. She's, okay. So we sent it to my boss, sent it to my boss's boss, sent it to my general manager, sent it to my area manager, sent it to our regional manager, sent it to our vice president, sent it to our president, sent it to the chairman of the board, secretary, and we got a phone call. Somebody uses this. And she called, and I said, where's page 13? I said, aha! What do you use page 13 for? She said, I put it in charts. Cool. Who looks at the charts? Another quote. The chairman's father used to. OK, thank you. No. How many horses are you holding? How many things are you doing because you've done it? Because that's the way we always do it. OK? Stop it. That's what we do is we look at processes. And before you automate a process or before you put computers in, Figure out what it's supposed to do and get rid of the stuff it's not supposed to do, as opposed to automating things that shouldn't be automated in the first place. Okay? So what can be done before any clinical trials are opening? They're called the dreaded TLAs, or three-letter acronyms, which are things like institutional review boards, scientific review committees, contracting grants, clinical trials, all this clinical research centers. All of this stuff is fixed cost. All this stuff is setup time. Nobody's ever looked at it. They just take how long they take. We're the first people to look at it. Okay? This is what it took to get. These are the people who would have to sign a study that I would do at Vanderbilt University. Here's all the people that had to sign, and here's all the people that may have to sign. Now, you want to hear the real interesting thing about this? They had 23 separate signature lines, and 22 would not sign until 21 has signed, and 21 wouldn't sign until 20 has signed, and 20 wouldn't sign until 19 has signed. They had somebody whose full-time job it was to go sit in somebody's office with a piece of paper going, hi. Oh, hi, you're here. Here, please. Okay, sign. Okay, I'm going to go sit in somebody else's office. Sit and wait. 
Why? Because it had to be signed. It had to be signed in order and sequence. That's a classic non-value added activity. It didn't change the safety of the study. It didn't change the efficacy of the study. It didn't change any of the scientific games. It didn't do anything except it did wonderful backfill to make sure all the paperwork was correct. Nothing. Okay? So, then we actually looked at timing, how long it took, and actual accrual data. I've talked a little bit about this, and a little bit about this. I haven't talked about this. This is the real scary one. Okay? You did all this work, did anybody show up? Okay? So this is what a process map looks like, and it's fairly standard and straightforward. I've got this idea of a concept, and I send it in for a review, and people vote on it. Then I do a concept review, then I send it to the government, they develop a protocol, then they develop forms, they develop basically funding, they develop regulatory affairs. You notice the brown boxes are all government agencies that get involved. Then they have what's called a centralized institutional review board review, and then they send it out. Okay? High level looks pretty good. Detail level looks like this. This is the smallest one, but this is 35 feet by 5 feet in 8 point font. When you actually put them together, you can't do it just with a cooperative group. You've also got to do it with the cancer therapy evaluation program and the CIRB. This one is 50 feet long by 5 feet. They have to also work with the one that's 45 feet by 5 feet. And you still can't put a patient on yet because it's never been appointed or approved to any individual hospital. That's another 37 feet. Okay? From the time Dominic had his brilliant idea, way over here, there's all the steps and all the processes and all the people that I had to go through before Vander, or excuse me, before Waterloo could put the first patient on staff. Okay? Now, you're a bright young investigator. No, you were only modest, but okay, you'll be bright young investigator now. Okay? There's my bright young investigator. You are now just graduated, you've just got your newly minted PhD, and you have this really cool idea. And I look you in the eye and I say, aha, this is a really cool idea. It'll take you two and a half years before you can get your first patient on study. Then it'll take you another year before you can collect enough data to analyze. Then it'll take you another year to analyze the data. What's going to happen to my bright young investigator? All the faculty members know she's not going to get tenure because you know what? I've been working on that stupid study that nothing's came out from it yet. So the best and the brightest aren't doing this because you know what? It takes too long. I can't bet my career on five years. I may have something of which I'm waiting around for two and a half years before anybody gets anything. So the director, John Nieder, the director of the National Cancer Institute, basically said, the best and the brightest are doing exactly the worst thing. You're a rational, you're a really, really smart lady. You got a PhD. What are you going to do? You're going to go work in a lab. Why? Because I can work in a lab, I can control the lab in eight months, I can get data up, I get published, I get promoted, I get tenure. You know, I become a name in my field. Great. And what happens to cancer patients? I'm a name in my field. Because you know what? No cancer drug gets approved until it goes through phase three clinical trial. You can't get there without going through this. So the best and the brightest, and by the way, when I'm an advisor, if you're my advisee, I tell you to do exactly what you're doing. I can't in good conscience say do this system because I know you're not going to work through the system. You can't be promoted. The system is fundamentally flawed and broken. Okay? It's fundamentally flawed. Okay? How many steps does it take? 810. How many working steps? How many decision points? This is the one I love. 38 potential independent individuals can be involved, part of the entire process. We are talking about enormous number of people. Now, any of you do any kind of lab bench work? Okay. Imagine you're doing a study that before you could even start your study, 38 people had to touch your specimen. Okay. What did you think of that? Like, Ew. No, I'm not going to do that. That's just, well, that's just how the system is. Okay. 38 separate groups have to approve it. Now, we talked about a little bit about the flow. This is, this is an example of what's called a loop. Okay? You have the bright idea. You're the investigator. By the way, here's your, you're the study chair. You've got this investigator. You send it to the cooperative group. They do some stuff. They send it down to the cancer therapy evaluation program. They send it back up to the cooperative group. They send it back to you. Send it back, send it back, send it back. These are called loops. Here, I got a good idea. I sent it to them who sent it out here to the CIRB, who sent it out to CTEP, who sent it over here, who sent it back to me. If you just count the number of times it came back to you, here you started it, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times it comes back to you before you can put a single patient on set. Three day kills. Look at how many times it goes to here, the cancer therapy evaluation program, how many times it goes to the cooperative group. It's not the fact that anybody's doing anything wrong, it's just the fact that you have to do it again and again and again and again and again and again. Okay? We need to cut down the number of loops, the number of times it keeps repeating itself. Okay? Why do you loop? Well, part of the thing is, in medicine, 
right, so in general manufacturing, what you're trying to do is called inspecting quality. If I keep looking at it, I'm going to make it better. So everybody keeps looking at it because they really don't know whether they can trust the system or not. In manufacturing, you build a process that it's really, really, really hard to make something wrong. Um, it's a USB drive. I cannot put the USB drive in upside down. Well, I could, given a big enough hammer. But it's really, 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 really hard to break the system. Okay? So engineering spends a whole lot of time making sure it's really hard to make something that's wrong, as opposed to saying, geez, I made one. I better inspect it. And I'll inspect it again. I'll inspect it again. I'll inspect it again. I better have a lot of people inspect it because I might have missed something. Okay? So they attempt to inspect in quality. We're trying to say, let's build a process that you don't have to do that. So the process itself is inherently of high quality of faith. Okay? Also, what happens is you get scope creep. You know what? Dominic's a brilliant man. Dominic always has brilliant studies. But you know, he's not really very good at optometry. So you know, he's, got, he's, actually, he's actually got a patient in optometry. I've got to send it by Bob up there. Oh, I've got to send it by Graham. Oh, my God, we're never going to get through. I've got to send it by Graham. Graham's going to, you know, this is a wonderful study that doesn't say squat about forensic optometry. <laughs> and we all know that forensic optometry is the be-all, end-all of everything optometric. I'm not going to prove it unless you do something about optometric, forensic optometry. Dominic's going, what the big Yes, Dr. Strong, not a problem, Dr. Strong, you run. Yes, I will put it in, right? 38 separate times, OK? Because you know what? They're both really, really smart people. I really have to respect them. But what happens is, because they're all part of the committee, they can all say, stop. That's called scope creep. You're responsible for saying, was this good science? You're not responsible for saying, by the way, you should have forensic optometry in it. But we're all good scientists. And by the way, we all do really good research, which means everybody ought to do our kind of research because it's really good. Right? right? Scope creep happens all the time. Okay? Lots and lots and lots of theory stuff. Theory, more reviews, better study. Practice, more reviews, slower opening. And there's no documented evidence. More people looking at it makes any difference. Okay? How many duplicate, redundant, and minimally added steps do you think are in this process? Let me cut down one small little piece of this process, just tiny little piece of this process, called the Institutional Review Board at Vanderbilt. Okay? We looked at this stuff, and we said, OK, we have eight primary people, primary groups that have to be involved. We have three secondary people that might be involved. We have 26 separate paperwork steps and moving things around. We have 12 value-added steps that actually made a difference to the study. We've got 29 separate sub-approvals. We have nine ways to die and one way to succeed. The only thing messier than this is Department of Defense procurement. One organization, I love this, one organization, their idea of a value-added thing is they had copy and sort day. They would take every study that came in and they would make 25 copies of it. And they'd put them on things like this. They'd stack them up. Okay? And everything that was going to go through the Institutional Review Board, they'd have a big stack up. And then one day, they had a team of people who would go in and pick a study up, 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 put it in a packet, and hand deliver it to the person in the IRB. One complete day of the entire staff of the clinical research office. And they went, that was very productive. No. <laughs> right? That's about as unproductive as you can possibly. All they were doing is shuffling paper back and forth. OK? That's a non-value-add activity. It made no difference to the value of the study. It made no difference to the safety of the study. How do we get rid of those things? When you actually break it down, we find out high level, it's about 75% of the stuff add value. When you actually detail it, it's about half the work you do makes a difference. Usually I give this talk in front of people who are clin clinical trials offices who are working 12-hour days, working their little tails off. And I say, half of what you do is busy work. And they go, oh, oh, oh. You could take half a week off, and no one would notice. What? Right? It's amazing how much non value added activity. Let me give you a microcosm of non value activity. I was asked to give a grand rounds talk at a major academic medical center. And they sent me a piece of paper. And I said, OK. And I fell off the piece of paper. And stupidly, I turned it back quickly. So you know what happens if you turn it back quickly? They send you more pieces of paper. So they sent me four pieces of paper. They fell off these four pieces of paper. And I said, aha, this is wonderful. On four pieces of paper, I had to put my complete name and address in three different areas. I'm almost OK with that. They also had three different places to put my AV requirements. 
Some people in this room know me. And I said, aha, let's see who wins. I need 35 millimeter slides. I need PowerPoint. I don't need anything. And I'll show up and see who wins. If somebody's got a projector, yes, OK, I know. The people over there want 35 mil. I got that. Right? Why do you have the identical information put slightly different ways? Because you can. Because this was done for a continuing medical education group. That was done for another group. That was done. Every group has their own particular form. Well, number one is, how much time did I waste? Fill out the same thing three different times. Number two is, what's my chance of making a mistake? If you do exactly the same thing three different times. By the way, were they embarrassed? <laughs> I said, hi, this is you guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> Non-value added activity. Why do you do it? Because I need a special piece of paper just for me. Okay? And I'm going to put it in a slightly different place, a slightly different way. Don't do that. That's non-value added. Okay? Lots and lots of stuff. Basically, things don't affect the quality, safety, the efficacy. Don't do it. Okay? Note, if you don't get any patients involved, in other words, you do no samples, you've done all your work building your survey, and nobody answers the survey, it doesn't matter. So let me talk about that. Oh, this is the time. Here's the, basically the 800 days it takes to get started, the median of 800 days. Here's the median. This one's, these gave us outliers. Here's the median days. Okay? And so this is how long it takes. By the way, it takes anywhere from one and a quarter years to about seven years. And I said, aha, tell me the difference between those studies. The answer is we don't know. What's your name? What? Naomi. Naomi's got a real interesting trial. She's, Naomi's going to put in the trial. You can either get it open in a year and a quarter or seven years. And Naomi's response is, what's the difference? And the answer is, I don't know. Okay. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. Some of them do, some of them don't. Okay? How do you manage that kind of thing? I just don't know. Okay? Some, some comparisons. Disneyland was created from breaking ground of the first paying customers in 366 days in 1955. John Kennedy was office, in office for a little over 1,000 days. I had a Canadian example that was totally was politically incorrect, so I took it out. So, yeah. Like it's, think of a prime minister who was in for a really short amount of time. <laughs> I'm not, not going to go there, okay? Yeah. This is an example of the flow. This particular study, when we traced it down, it took 975 days. Here's the amount of time it took in each of the steps, in each of the phases, in each of the groups. It's just a phenomenal amount of time because you keep doing it again and again and again and again and again, okay? The current system is inefficient, time consuming, and underfunded. Yes, enormously. So, when I look to every other place in the planet, every other place in the planet, new to the world products have gone down by 42%. How long does it take to build a brand new iPhone or the brand new i whatever they're going to build next? Faster and faster and faster. What happens to drugs? Drugs have gone up from 56 months to 144 months. It's worse and worse and worse and worse. We're making it worse and worse and worse. Okay? We need to fix it. What happens if we double the budget? I already mentioned that. I said nearly nothing, but they wouldn't turn the money down, which is true. <laughs> okay? When functional areas don't quite fit together, <laughs> it's actually owned by the Harley Davidson company, but that's a different issue, but okay. We actually simulated what would happen if everybody played well together. We said, what happens? This is what it currently looks like after five years, about 99 studies, takes about 800 days. If everybody just worked together, we would go from 99 to about 121 studies open. We would reduce the time down to 552. What's even more important for Naomi is this. I can do it from plus or minus 760 days to plus or minus a month. I can bet my career in plus or minus a month. I'm not going to bet my career in plus or minus 760 days. And you know what we did? This entire incredibly elaborate, sophisticated operations research simulation said, play well together. All you had to do to play well together is set the same priorities on studies. That's all we said to do. That's it. If they did that, that's the kind of phenomenal change we have. And you should see bureaucrats running, oh, really? Hmm. No, we couldn't really work together with them. So, conclusion, there's no simple silver bullet that's going to fix it. Everybody blames everybody else. There's no, there's things that are called floating bottlenecks, so basically things that move around and around and around. And only by working together can you dramatically change things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this one. You've done all of this work, 920 days of your life you've spent doing this. Guess what? 30% of the time, nobody shows up. Not even your patients go to your study. 60% of the time, less than five patients show up. 
these are four major academic medical centers that were selected because they were the best in North America at oncology clinical trials. This is not average. These are the best. 60% of the studies from the best result in under five. Can you publish a study with under five patients? No. All that work, all that time, all that effort, you're going to spend all that time, and you got a 60% chance of getting nothing. No, I don't think. Oh, by the way, you have a 10% chance of succeeding. Anybody want to bet your tenure? All right, I got real money, I'll bet you. <laughs> right? It's incredible. We broke it up basically whether they're cooperative group studies or non cooperative group studies, and we still found it's phenomenally. This is if you started it and only going to run it at Waterloo, 20%, nobody shows up. It's your own study with your own patients, and you don't even accrue people. Why? Because you can't. Because you can open a study and open a study and open a study. Okay? This is really when I go to the clinical trials office, people and I say, take a day off because you know what? Nobody's going to show up. Nobody's going to notice. Okay? These are people who are working incredibly long, incredibly hard hours because they're constantly building studies, but nobody shows up. Okay? Biggest answer? Just say no. We're not going to do your study because it takes too much time. It's not going to get to you where you want to be. By the way, this is phase three clinical trials. These are all phase three clinical trials for an eight-year period that were funded to cure cancer. Okay? All of them. You all have to go through phase three clinical trials. 49% did not even achieve 25% of their stated goals. 64% did not achieve their minimum projected accruals. Okay? By the way, real nasty, almost 6,000 patients were accrued to these studies that will never see the light of day because you can't publish them. 36% met or exceeded their minimum accruals. Now note, particularly about, whoop, no, don't do it. No, it won't go backwards. Particularly about the 60%, okay? In the 60%, you literally got years and years and years of effort, and you cannot come up to a scientifically valid conclusion because you don't have enough patience on this thing. You've walked off the ice rink after two periods and said, that's close enough. We have no way of knowing. Okay? Does time make a difference? At one of the cooperative groups, we just plotted for fun. Here's whether you hit your accrual goals or not, and here's if you didn't. And the red ones are the ones that took greater than the median time to open, and the blue ones are the ones that took less than the median time to open. It's like, wow, there's some relationship here. So we actually ran some studies, and come to find out, when you run the studies, you find out that if you open them fast, guess what? You've got a much higher likelihood of meeting your goals. If you open them after slow, it's not going to happen. And it's a real straightforward example. You're a brilliant scientist. You've got this brilliant idea. You just came from the latest academic meeting. It's really cool stuff. And then it takes you two and a half years to get it ready. Two and a half years later, how many major scientific meetings have you gone to? How much has been published in the journals? How many changes have taken place? And that really cool whiz-bang stuff is kind of no longer really cool whiz-bang stuff. Okay? What I never knew is that oncology and medicine is a fashion business. This is a drug that was really in fashion. We're going to get people. This is a drug that's no longer in fashion. We're not going to accrue any patients because it's just not fashionable anymore. Okay? Well. I'm a fashion business. I mean, I remember when Just In Time first came out. I thought, ah, it's a fad. Now everybody teaches Just In Time and lean manufacturing. Right? We're in fashion. You can't publish it unless it's what people respect. Same kind of thing. What one postpones, one actually abandons. If it takes too long, don't do it. You might as well just quit. Okay? This is what people respond to me. Looks like you've got all the data. What's the holdup? Tell me what I should do. Right? I'm buried in all these information. Okay? So, let me give you some recommendations we talked about. Immediate, intermediate, long range, or mid range, and long term. Okay? First one is start collecting and analyzing data. We're the only people that actually collected this data. It's incredible. They all have it, nobody looks at it. Okay? So analyze, figure out what it is. This is those groups that accrue above average and those groups that are below, below average. You know what? This is the national data. We looked at these and nobody had ever looked at them before. Guess what? I want to open my study in this organization, and I sure don't want to open my study in this organization. I can tell you who's giving you a high performer. Don't say that. That'd be bad. You know? This is like, you know what? I own a baseball franchise, but don't record batting average, because it would be bad. We don't want to compare people. 
What do you mean you don't want to tell battery average? I want to know that. Oh, no, no. They would, they would be hurt. Don't tell them. <laughs> okay, right? So, use standardized consistent terminology. This is an informatics problem. I love this. We're doing this work, and we're saying, aha, we have an approved study. We can get a patient. They said, no. Okay, what do you need? We need final approval. Cool. Can we put a patient on? No. Why not? Because you need final, final approval. We're waiting for the double secret final approval, maybe. Right? By the way, nothing ever documented final, final approval, ever. You had to find it through the system. And it kept saying, can we now put a patient on? No, you can't. Okay? You schedule or schedule priorities or priorities and those that are no. 50% of the studies came down, they were number one priority. You know what that meant to the people in the work? Screw it, they're all number one priority. We'll do whatever we want. So they didn't care. What's a penalty if you're late? I love this part. This was great. It's like a student that comes to you and says, aha, I've got a paper, give me another week. He said, okay, because I'm a nice guy. Take another week. You come back after six days going, oh my God, I need another week. What do I do? I give you another week. You come back after two weeks and go, oh my gosh, I missed it. Give me more time. My answer is sure, give me more time. That's exactly what they do. They have a 60-day rule. You had to get stuff responded in 60 days. After 90 days, you went back and said, I missed it, I need more time. Their response was, okay, have more time. Crazy system. The one I really love is 14 disapproved concepts had protocols created, 11 of which resulted in people being put on study. 14 times they said, no, and they didn't anyway. Okay? 17 times you said, I don't want to do this anymore, and you put patients on it anyway. Okay? 31 studies were turned down, and they did them anyhow. There was no penalty. I have five kids. Don't eat the cookie. I ate the cookie. There was penalties. There was like, oh, was it good? It's like, no. Just tell them no. Just say stop it. Okay? Controlling the flow, I talked about this a little bit before. Um, the inflow of this one group had 44 letters of intent that came in. They had 75 concept protocol in queue. They'd open about 18 per year. If all you did is say, all I'm going to do is work on the concepts I've got in hand, it's going to take me over four years to clear the queue. You're going to put in your new study? It's going to be done when it's done. Okay? You can't wait for that. Okay? So a no uttered from deepest conviction is better and greater than a yes merely uttered to please or it's worse to avoid trouble. I presented this, and one of the guys actually implemented it. He came back to me and said, you know, I took your advice, and I told the distinguished Professor Dominic that we wouldn't do his studies, and you know he won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> and I said, good! Now, if they're that petty that you say no to them, because you know what? If I send something into New England Journal of Medicine and they say no, I go, okay. It's not a personal front. Well, it is, but it's like, yeah, okay, I understand. You, know, you only accept about 3%. I don't go, oh my God, you, you're, you're a hateful person. No, it just doesn't happen that way. Okay? Now, you can think, to think in the future and work your way back. I'm going to do this really quickly. Um, this is just doing this thing and just running through and saying, let me run through the statistics. If you figure out how many they open, you can figure out how many they should open. And if you tell people you've only got 10 slots, that's all. Rather than say, whatever idea comes up, it's a totally different perspective. So I work to tell people about the slots. Okay? So when there are massive budget cuts and increased needs, whose research should be funded? This is an incredibly easy question. Because you know what the answer is? Mine. And that's what every investigator says. Because what happens is this. My trial is the center of the universe. It is where the world is going, otherwise I would not do it. This is exactly how we looked at the universe, because the sun does revolve around the earth because I can watch it. Right? Look, there it goes. I can see. It's got to be me. Well, guess what happens? Your trial from a clinical cancer center is just one of many trials. It's kind of like what we see in the universe today. This is our star. We're over here. We're one of 100 billion stars in one galaxy of 100 million galaxies. I mean, you're kind of, yeah, you're, yeah, okay, fine. Right? How do you triage? How do you figure out what's best? And I worked a lot with organizations about figuring out if it's high scientific merit and easy to do, go do it. If it's of high complexity, hard to do, and questionable, okay science, don't do it. If it's of high complexity and high scientific merit, that's why Dominic gets paid the big bucks. Make the decision. This is going to take the entire proton accelerator budget for the next 10 years. But wow, it'll find this really cool thing. Do that. If it's of low, low scientific merit and low complexity, in other words, it's easy to use it as a fill. Okay, just do it. Okay? Now, what's really important is unless the decision is degenerated into work, it is not a decision. It is best a good intention. Good thoughts. Okay? Now, good thoughts. I'm really taking this to heart because last Thursday, I took the job as director of clinical research at the Knight Cancer Institute, 
and the professor of healthcare management, the division of management at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm actually going to go be the guy responsible for doing this stuff, which is scary. Because it's a whole lot easier yelling at other people how they should do it, and now I have to do it. Right? But I just took this job last Thursday. So if you write me back in a year, I'll go, oh my god, I was really dumb last year. But okay. <laughs> okay. So what do you think of, I'm going to go back to the questions. What do you think of a cooperative group that accepts 70% of the concepts? What do you think of a process owner that always quotes 60 days, no matter what? What do you think of a clinical trial system? It's going to take a year or it's going to take seven years. What do you think of a comprehensive cancer center that never accrues 30% patients to 30% of their studies? NCI phase three clinical trials that did not achieve minimum accrual of 64% of the time. And none of them were aware of it or ever asked why. And now, now they're aware of it and they're starting to ask why. Because it's embarrassing when you have somebody like me say, this is bad, and then I publish it, which is really embarrassing. Oh, damn. Okay. So there's some good news. There's places like the Mayo Clinic's doing some neat stuff. The NCI has just done a standardized contract language, which is phenomenally important. It's going to be really speed up the system. I, when you do this kind of stuff, you get invited to all these national thingies. I'm part of an Institute of Medicine meeting. I'm part of what's called the Operational Efficiency Working Group stuff. But I want to bring it all the way back. This is what really is most important. This is what's really critical. There are 1.4 million cancer incidences per year in America. There's about 600,000 deaths. In Canada, there's 138,000 instances and about 66,000 deaths. Think of what happens if you do my one engineering economic or one engineering formula. Think of the days it takes to do a setup for the comprehensive cancer center, the cooperative group, the number of phases. And all we can do is reduce the non-value activities by a little bit, by about 25%. What happens, the bottom line to cancer patients, if you just cut out 25%, you're going to affect 2.6 million cancer lives. If you do it with cancer deaths, you're going to affect about a million cancer deaths. Why aren't we doing it? All because of paperwork. Okay? We need to fix the system because it's broken and people are dying because it's broken. Thank you. Very, very great presentation. So questions, uh, you have to throw back at them. Now that he knows all your names, you have to just call on you. Questions or comments from any of you? Sir. <laughs> oh. I would think this system then, in terms of groups going forward with drugs and so forth, would uh, favor the, the big companies? In other words, if you start out as a... No? No, no, no. actually it doesn't. What, because what happens is, what, what, what transpires is researchers look for the really neat molecule or the really neat drug. And, and so what they'll do is they'll say, wow, that's a really neat drug. What, what happens in smaller companies is not so much the, the startup process, is when it gets in the middle of the process, they go, okay, when can you supply me? And the startup company goes, excuse me? You know, we're going to need 3,000 doses of these things by tomorrow. And they go, excuse me? And, and the problem is just being able to scale up and deliver the drugs. So the, the problem is not, uh, from that regard, it's not, the, the interest is there from the scientists. One of the real, one of the most difficult problems, and it happens in cancer, it's not a single drug treatment. It's when you put two drugs together, you get significantly bigger bang for your buck. But if those two drugs are made by two different companies, that is a phenomenally hard thing to do, not because of science, because of contracting. Okay. Let me give an example. Viagra, for what it's used for now, is an unintended side effect of a drug for hypertension. It wasn't built for that. And somebody wrote down, well, that's an interesting side effect, right? Well, the question came down to who owned the discovery of that side effect? Because the company didn't know it did it, but the people who did the study knew it did it. So who owned that discovery? And there was a major battle as to who should get what reward for that kind of thing. So imagine I'm going to put together drug A and drug B, and I'm going to put it together. You know what? They work exceedingly well. Cool. Because my drug or your drug? You know, whose drug actually did it? Oh, what's really bad that happens in a lot of cases is we're going to do a controlled clinical trial. We're going to do no drug, well, actually standard of care drug. We're going to do drug A, drug B, drug A, and B. Well, drug A is kind of OK. Drug B is a little better than drug A, and drug A and B is a little bit better than both. Who's going to win? Well, if I make B, I want B to sell, and I don't care about A. And so there's just the contract language is really, 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 really complex. So yeah, that's part of the problem. And then let me go one other, one step back. In the 1960s, virtually all the cancer drugs came from one location, the National Institute of Health. 
they were the place that made all the cancer drugs because they were the one that was dedicated for doing that research. Today, they're a small part of that. It all comes from some other place, usually biotech startups or, or companies like Amgen. So it's a very, very, very different kind of business. Okay. Good question. Thanks, Bob. Let me I'll throw a question in, uh, David. The, uh, interestingly, trials themselves, we have clinical trial management systems. <laughs> yeah. And uh, may, I wonder if you could comment on those, but to what degree, even if you've got this ridiculous process, to what degree could you improve it by simply speeding up some of the paper handling with you know, forms management software and things like that? I think OpenText has done something on this related to FDA compliance. Can you comment on that? Uh, what happens is that's going to solve part of the problem. Basically, I mean, remember the one I talked about, the sort day? We, that part, that solves an aspect of the problem by automating and having a central location repository for the paperwork. That's a really, really good idea. The dilemma that happens is people are still having to figure out, fill out that paperwork in the first place. And there's an enormous amount of paperwork, as I showed you with those four pieces of paper, that, that we just automated that. Well, the answer is why? Why not just have one piece of paper with standard headings and then everything else fills in? So some of the clinical, most of the clinical trial management systems I've seen are built to automate what you already do. As opposed to say, why do I do it in the first place? Let me clean out the underbrush and let's build a system today. Uh, and, and you can save probably, and this is a guess, 10 to 15% by automating and get rid of a lot of that stuff that you're doing today. But the fundamental changes that need to take place can't be done by doing that. It, you just can't make it significant enough. Um, and, and I mean, it, it's just not going to happen. And my, problem, my issue with that, and, and, and as an old computer guy, is, is the more you get a clinical trial management system, the more you calcify into a computer your processes, the harder they are going to change. Anyway, basically it's like, that's how the computer does it. And I'm sure you and I have both been to systems that you say, why do you, hit, you know, why do you have to hold shift control Q down? Well, because that's how it's programmed. It's like, just don't do that. So that, that's part of my thing with clinical trial management systems. Some of them are, are good, but they're not going to fix the system. Um, Matter of fact, the NCI is working on a thing that I don't think is going to fix the system because it's a point solution as opposed to an overall solution. I worked in a, did some major research project in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and uh, they um, automated, I think it was the accounts payable area, I can't remember, and uh, with the expectation that it was going to make a big difference in the handling of requisitions. And it made no difference right. because uh, really the problem was uh, getting the requisition signed, which required over 20 signatures. I mean, that's a real study and it's real, real work, and we have this problem. But if you take those process maps, which don't have really a time dimension in them, okay? No. Okay. Are there any points in those process maps that if you had to hit on the big delays, in other words, that would make the most difference, or is it just spread out? Is it sort of a disseminated disease or any local nodes or, or, or lesions you can remove. Okay, it, it is a disseminated disease, but you can, you can solve parts of it. The dilemma that happens, um, am I doing it right? Uh, the dilemma that happens is because, no, I'm not right, uh, because it's spread out so many places. And what happens, and, and this is what everybody kept asking me, is if I just hire more protocol clerks, if I just hire more of fill in the blank people, life will be much, much, much better. Okay, and the answer is it isn't gonna work. Uh, wherever it is, oh, there it is, okay? The dilemma is this. I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna solve this little piece right here. And boy, if I solve this little piece, life will be really, really good. The answer is, well, yeah, but what happens is you solve this little piece, you're not gonna save that amount of time because suddenly it's gotta go down here and you're gonna lose that time. Then it's gonna have to go back up and you just basically get buried in all the system. Once again, everybody kept saying, it's the Institutional Review Board, it's the protocol development, it's the other industry, it's the FDA. Everybody kept pointing to everybody else. And we actually ran a simulation that said, okay, if, once again, if we cut out a whole major section of this process, it doesn't make any difference because if you don't cut out from the other organization that has to approve it, it doesn't make any difference. See, this work still has to take place even if these guys can get it done in a day. These guys are still going to plod along at their own standard pace. That's the problem. But this is the biggest challenge. Now, you're saying it's like a big bang phenomenon. In other words, there aren't any local things. You have to get this thing changed at a radical level. Yes. What kind of take up are you getting on that? I mean, other than taking a job to do it, I mean, but. Phenomenally high. The, let me, the, 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 the my, uh, the, this, uh, this, believe it or not, is, is really the single greatest quote. Um, this one right here, okay? Um, this is from John Niederhuber. Why is this the single greatest quote? Because he's the guy that funds it all. Okay? This is the guy who pays the money for it all. He says, it's broken. Now, the most interesting thing you have if you're a government agency is I cannot tell you how to fix a system. Because okay? governments don't know how to do it. 
but I can set the rules. And so he can say, listen, matter of fact, he has said this. He said it publicly. I will not, well, let me rephrase it. He said the time to take open clinical trials is unconscionable and it will be cut in half. Okay, period. Can he, can he enforce that on the civil service and so on? Or? Yes, because number one is the civil service works for him. Okay. And number two is he can go to all the other folks and say, you've got a major cancer center renewal grant. If you can't open studies within this time, we're not going to refund you. And anybody who lives and dies based on research grants go, oh, wow, okay. And he said in the multiple times in multiple public forums to people who he supports with funds, you will have to cut it in half. Now, at, at, at the three different levels, at the government, you work for him, and you will do this, period, or he will find out a way to do it. For the cooperative groups, he funds you, and he says, I will, you, this will be a major priority for your reevaluation for refunding. For the comprehensive cancer centers, he does the same thing. For the cooperative groups, he funds most of their work. For the cancer centers, he funds a small percentage of their work. But to have a comprehensive cancer center designation is like having the best good housekeeping seal of approval you can possibly imagine. And to lose one is a phenomenal embarrassment. They won't lose one. So while he can't tell you what to do, he can say the rules now say you will do this. And I was, I was where you are about two years ago. I was saying, you know, it's all good, clean, fun. Who cares, you know, because nobody's making any changes. And John stood up and said, no, it's unacceptable. It'll work. You will fix it. That then caused the Institute of Medicine constituted a group. The NCI has constituted at least two groups to fix this stuff. And they're, they're changing the metrics of how people are going to be evaluated. And, and it's like all of us who live and die based on research contracts, if the funder says today you're going to have to do ABC, you're going to do ABC. So that's, that's what he's doing. So I'm, I've got a lot of great faith. By the way, to let you know, I've also studied the National Cancer Institute of Canada, NCIC. You're just as bad. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, has anybody here uh, had a similar experience in Canada that, I mean, Graham, you do trials, don't you? No? <laughs> Maybe not, but that being, so you, when you say the NCIC, have you actually, uh, you've looked at that, have you? Or, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, it, yeah, it, it takes just as long. Matter of fact, that, the, that's, they, they invited me to come up to give a keynote address to explain to them how bad it was, and they all went, Ugh! then they went, oh. It's got to be just the people in the States. You know, we're not that bad. And I said, yeah, it is. It's you too. And they went, oh. So. so industrial engineering comes into the modern times and changes the world. Any other comments or questions? Anything? Anybody? I'll make sure I don't miss anybody. Uh, if not, uh, I mean, first of all, that was one of the best lectures I've ever heard. So I, I really enjoyed it. I thought you were going to burst at several points there. I definitely well, thought. As, 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 as I tell people, you ought to see me when I was drinking coffee. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I know. I definitely thought you were going to exceed the speed of light with regard to, to speaking, so I gather you weren't transmitting any information at that time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you very much. Very much enjoyed that. Thank you. Shirley? No. <laughs> no, I just want to say thanks as well, and thank you, thank you to all the people that came out to hear the talk today. Thank you very much. So uh, I look forward to you all coming back to our next seminars, uh, one on Wednesday and one on February the 11th. And, Thank you again so much for coming and visiting our university.